literally Eddie was in our dressing room every day. He loved talking music. You know, everybody tells, tells these stories, but it's true. Eddie would not, he, he was just constantly wanting to talk about music or guitars. He was in our dressing room every day. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. Available wherever you stream. Catch up on past interviews and episodes on demand now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of it. Uh, let's get right into this. Our next guest, brand new record, came out on August 12th called Vibrating. You can pick it up now wherever you get your music. Also, number 22 in the Canadian Pure Album Sales, by the way, which is Boom. pretty damn cool. Uh, they're currently on the road, a bunch of tour dates. You can catch them performing. Tickets are on sale now. Visit CollectiveSoul.com. Welcome back to the show, the one and only Will Turpin from Collective Soul. What's happening? Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, day off in San Diego. Uh so oh, I'm that's the greatest right town. On, that's the greatest town in North America. I you gotta, gotta kind of like it, man. I agree. Uh, <sighs> lots of good. Then fun you head stuff. over to Old Town and La Jolla, and gorgeous. By the way, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, the first time I saw you guys play was opening for Van Halen on the Balance Tour. Does that yep. makes sense. Yeah, you are correct. You yeah, are correct. Uh, yeah, that Jeremy, would have been 1995. Uh, yeah. And I tell people often that was one of the that was that literally I don't know if we'd be the we wouldn't be the same band without that tour. Uh, the way the friendships we created were great. That's obviously one of the most prized things in my life that I that you know that I knew Eddie Van Halen. That I'm still wow. friends with Michael and Sammy. That's one of the yeah. most special things in my life. But when they took us under their arm and really uh, it was like big brothers maybe the cool uncle uh, they they really took us under their arm yeah and showed us showed us what's up um and treated us so well uh and started us honestly uh you know Eddie Van Halen started us um down the road of of getting out of our first management deal that was sour um he wow. helped us uh pointed us in the right direction we 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 told him our concerns and he's like yes these sounds like real concerns uh let me help mm. you guys out and uh there's there's so many different ways that they helped us and 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 um really really made us part of who we are today is because of that tour uh, three months with uh van halen it's interesting how like you know lives. they were they were van halen but they were still accessible to you backstage and you can have a conversation about a shitty contract with eddie like that's that's amazing uh literally eddie was in our dressing room every day he loved talking music you know everybody tells tells these stories but it's true. Eddie would not. He, he was just constantly wanting to talk about music or guitars. He was in our dressing room every day. When, wow. when we walked in the arena, within five minutes, Eddie Van Halen was in there with his guitar and his cigarette. And most of the time in that era, a non-alcoholic beer. He, he was a creature yeah. of this is how I live. This is what I do. Wow. And that's the way he was every day. So you had sober Eddie Van Halen at the time. We had sober, sober Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. Damn. That's yeah, incredible. and I got to remember, you know, when the band would play Shine, the crowd, even though it was a Van Halen crowd, would just go nuts. They just went lighter. Yeah, because Van Halen crowds are infamously pretty, like, hard to get over, like, yeah. for the opening act. Like, it's usually hard to get over. And yeah, I don't, yeah, I guess I don't know what it is, man. We get out there with no pretentiousness and we know that we can only do what we do. And I think that maybe comes across uh, somehow gets to the crowd. It's not like, yeah. <laughs> You're not going to try to show up Van Halen anyway, right? Wow. I mean, <laughs> and you're not going <laughs> to. And you're not going to. That's it. just not, that's the wrong mentality. And I, and I think, uh, and we do that no matter who we're sharing the stage with. Uh, but um, yeah, we didn't feel any of that when we were on tour with them in 95. We really did. The crowd embraced us. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of rumor and speculation about that tour. It was kind of like the tear, it was deteriorating with the relationship and stuff. Did you get any sense of that when you were backstage with Sam and Ed? Like, did you see, did they, did they give no, up the they vibe they were fighting great. or like? Man, no, they were getting along great. They were, they were having, I did. <laughs> all right. I got, I got, I do got one story. It's kind of funny. All right. Because right, awesome. uh, they're my favorite like, band but, of all time. So I love the Van Halen stories. You and, know? and, and Jeremy's very jealous of me because you were what at that time? Well, one, look, Mitch, one years old. On you were like, one I was in one 95. years old when, when that tour happened. But right. as a consolation <laughs> prize, I saw you guys open up. I saw the double bill with you in the circle at Jones Beach about yeah, five years the, ago. Nobody cares. I saw so, Collective Soul in their infancy with Van Halen. That <laughs> I beat you. I, I listen. I win. Whatever, Mitch. That Get back wins. to your story, Will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember uh, me and me and Ed, our Ed, 
we're talking to Eddie and we were telling him about uh, the songs that we liked on, on the balance record. Yeah. And we're like, man, the Amsterdam, what a rock song. Um, and it wasn't because they weren't getting along. They did get along that whole tour, but he's like, yeah, I love that riff and the whole music part. But then the chorus, wham, bam, Amsterdam. What is that? What does that mean? And I'm like, uh Oh, <laughs> is he asking me to pick sides right now? So I didn't, I didn't even comment. I was like, yes, yeah, I guess, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, hold on. Now, I got to ask you, what would you have put as the chorus on that song? I'm good with Wham Bam Amsterdam. <laughs> there you go. That's right. And it's, Can't Stop Loving You is one of the greatest whatever power ballads, whatever you want to call it, of that era. Yeah, uh, man. Totally. Ultimate classic rock I'm, be damned. I'm excited about the, the new Circle record that's coming out. Mike, we just played a couple festivals with Sammy and Michael, Sammy and the Circle. And uh, they're real excited about it. They they are truly excited about the new stuff they created. So I can't I yeah. can't wait to hear it myself. Yeah, that first song that they put out, it's it's rocking. Like it's really good. I mean, they put out that concept record a couple of years ago, and like it was it was decent. But I think they're getting more back to you know some fun party songs. You know, that's what I'm getting from them. And like I said, they're uh, they're extremely proud of it. So that's a good sign that yeah. you know guys like that don't just they're not just BSing when they tell you how proud they are of their music. I want to read you a quote from a variety review from that show that you guys did in L.A. on the Balance Tour. It says, the Stockbridge natives proved capable of assuming the rock god mantle with straight ahead 70s meets 90s fair and were particularly impressive on Smashing Young Man. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's that's a glowing review. I, I think you won them all. <laughs> <laughs> I was 23 and just happy to, like I said, we we do our thing and that's 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 what we do. You know, we don't we're not trying to be something we're not, or we're not overthinking the X's and O's. It's about energy and vibe, and, and that's yeah. what we get out there and do. Yeah, and, but I and, love the fact that they go, you know, 70s meets 90s fair. I mean, like, is that sort of the vibe that you I'll guys go for with the band? Yeah, I'll like, take that. yeah. Yeah? If I had to take a, a, a decade, it would be the 70s. I would take the 70s yeah. on the deserted island question, right? Which decade? Yeah. It would definitely be the 70s. I, I can even live without the Beatles as long as I got the all the Wings records, you know? Wow. <laughs> but, but but let me tell you this from the fan perspective uh, from back then. There was a time like in 94, 95, 96 where hair metal was done, grunge was sort of uh, grinding to a halt and they started having these weird packages where Van Halen would take a collected like bands that were sort of like different and they did that a lot and a lot of them didn't work. You'd go see Poison and you'd see this other band, you go I want to see that fucking other band. But when you got to Collective Soul and Van Halen, you sort of went, oh, it works. Like there was there was a bridge between the two eras and you went, OK, OK, I can buy into this. I'm I'm down with this. So did you did you will at that time have that thing where you saw these sort of weird packages where they were trying to get the older dinosaur band with the hipper young band? You just went and it worked for you, though, right? Yeah, I didn't I didn't really even think about it that way. I remember. Um... I remember being in the studio in Miami and um, I think our agent had told like, cause Sammy, I don't know if it was Sammy or Eddie, but Sammy was the one that called us that day, but they wanted collective soul. It was not something that was done right. with agents shaking hands and managers agreeing. They wanted us to play with them. Um, so that's how it started. We were in the studio in Miami and I believe our agent had probably told Van Halen that we were, we were busy. We were going to finish up a record. Well, Sammy would not take no for an answer and uh, leave it to an agent and, to almost ruin that. Right. Right. <laughs> Without even telling us, Sammy would not take no for an answer. And he calls um, back in the day when there was a receptionist answering an actual landline and buzzing into the uh, control room. Uh, hey, Sammy Hagar wants to talk to Ed. <laughs> and uh, Edwin took the call. I remember him coming back going, we're going on tour. We got to wrap this. Uh, we got to wrap this second record up in about three days. Uh, we're going on tour with Van Halen. So, damn. And and listen, I, I understand Sammy wanting the band. You look at uh, Collective Soul's Billboard mainstream rock chart success. Shine number one. December number one. The world I know number one. And I could say this for the next twenty songs. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Number one. Number one. Number one. <laughs> right. We've got some bangers. Yeah. We've got some bangers, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, that's um, a good assessment, <laughs> and, and it's it's uh, it's a good problem to have. But we can't even we can't even put all the 
all the number ones in, into the hour and a half set list at this point. You know, we got to we got to play a little bit of the new stuff um, and we got to play some of those songs that are just deeper cuts. But, you know, when we when we make a set list, we want the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows. Right. And uh, not all the number ones even make it, but it's a great problem to have, man. Well, let me just ask you yeah. about the problems of the number one as you start having this success, does the record company start coming to you and start saying, all right, listen, Shine was number one, December was number one, write us another song like Shine, write it. Like you come with the new material and they go, yeah, I don't hear another December, start again. Like did, 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 the, did the success sort of become an albatross? Yeah, and especially in that time, you it, everybody thought you had to follow the charts. Um, mm we've kind of grown past that where we don't have to necessarily follow the charts. Although right. we, we do keep track of what's going on and, and uh, you know, we're really excited about how the new record's been received. Uh, right. But yeah, we had to, you had to follow charts. All your success was kind of dependent on, on, on those hits and the charts. Uh, I remember the dosage record. I remember us going back in because they were like, they, Atlantic said something similar to that. We don't quite hear it. And then we went back in and we came out with run, uh, wow. which was like more of the, the laid back pop hit. And I think we might've done the, another number one rock track after they pushed us a little bit. I think we went back and recorded heavy after they pushed us a little bit. They wanted a little more. So yeah, it did happen a couple times, but I, I, like I said, um, worked out. Those, the, in that in that instance with dosage it kind of worked because i mean heavy ended up being another number one rock track you know right yeah. and it's just funny because the the person that told me about this was doug feger of the knack and he says mitch you don't understand my sharona is a golden albatross it's golden because i've got this pool and i've got these cars and the, but it's an albatross because every time i went to the record company with a new song they'd say yeah it's not my sharona try again <laughs> yeah and that's annoying yeah, that's pretty annoying. Uh, we also had that that thing where we the first record was an independent record, and we had recorded it all our own. We grew right. up in the studio. We're, we're self-proclaimed studio rats. Uh, yeah. Ed was head engineer at my father's studio for years. Um, where was the studio? The studio was in Stockbridge, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in Jonesboro, Georgia now. It's, it's mine. Uh, uh, the new studio was built in 2003, Real to Real Studios. But um, is it actually real to real though, that, or is it is it digital? <laughs> yeah, we do have a two inch machine that barely gets cranked up. Hey, uh, there you yeah, go. There's not many reels of tape being used anymore. Uh, yeah. But um, but yeah, because of the success of the first one, where they had no say whatsoever, it was it was you know it was Ed in the studio with half of that record. Uh, it, half that record wasn't even a a band recording per se. There might have been. Shane or Ross or somebody recording something on a song, particular song, but half of that was um, intended for Ed to sell songs. He wanted to try, you know, he, he was getting, his friends were getting married and getting real jobs. And he was 28, 29 years old and he was going to try to sell some songs. So oh, wow. um, the so way that the success to be a was with that first record, they, they, they did keep their nose out of the studio a lot with us because they knew that we had something going on and they let us do our thing. That's interesting. Were, were you signed as an artist? Because he, Brian Adams wasn't signed as an artist. He was signed as a songwriter, and they said he'll never be a, an artist. He'll and then eventually him. him and Valance, he became one. Was, was Ed in that thing where he wanted to be for the publishing and not part of a band? He was definitely exploring that, like I said. I mean, really? he, was, he was getting there. Uh, you know, Shane was already in his band. Who You know, me, Shane, and Ross, all the same age in high school, and Dean as well. Uh, so Shane was right out of high school, it, always right by Ed. He was his drummer. Uh, yeah, so you got to keep an eye on Ed. He might just but run the, off. But the rest, the, yeah, the rest of us, Ed's, Ed's friends were getting married and getting real jobs, like I said. And so he was exploring some different options. Uh, right. And, you know, we, we, we grew up in that studio and it, it's really one of our strengths, that and the chemistry of, of where we came from. Yeah. Well, I mean, 11 albums later, uh, <laughs> this record comes out. You're getting back into the top 40 charts. Vibrating, by the way, Collective Soul, available now wherever you get your music. What was the recording process for this record? Is it the band going in, cutting it off the floor, or was it kind of like a Zoom thing? No, we definitely have to get together. That's one of the things that we, we start all the recordings with, again, the vibe and the feel. 
So, um, yeah, man. And, and, and the way they start, I, I really take a lot of pride in how we do it. We, we make, we make sure rhythm section wise and, and the guts of the song, we make sure that the, uh, the vibe and the feeling and the intention of where the energy is going to go is, is all there. And we can't capture that by sending a track to Johnny in Indianapolis and then me and Jonesboro. It just, it wouldn't be the same. Right. Uh, so we get together and, and we, we start this thing in a room together, man. We have to do that. When you're composing new songs, how conscious are you of it being able to be translated to the live venue? Do you sort of say, we'll put in loops and this and that and we'll just make some art? Or do you say, if I can't play this live, don't talk to me? We, you know, I think it's, we don't think about that a whole lot. We just, we, that's one of those things we just figure out later. But uh, we definitely know it's got to it's got to sound like a rock band. We're not going to get in there and get too, um, you know, it's not going to be a, a science experiment. You know, it's going to, it's got to sound like it comes from the heart. It's got to sound like a rock band. Um, yeah. We like getting experimental, but it's got to sound like a rock band. And if it sounds like the rock band, then we know we can re recreate it somehow. Yeah. And the cool thing about Collective Soul Records, I mean, if you listen to all of them back to back, it's like they're incredibly organic and it sounds like a band is playing. So you, you have achieved that. And a lot of bands don't have the ability to do that because, you know, they get into the programming and the this and, and the that. But right, they that, pro tool it to death. I mean, you, you, yeah, you need some of that imperfection to make it sound good, to make it sound human, real. <laughs> yeah. And it's on there. It's on the new record. There's a, there's one solo. Oh, I can't remember the song right now. Uh, it might be undone. Uh, right. The solo was a first take, and there's a there's a tiny little mess up in there. But something about the flow and the vibe. It was Jesse's first take on that solo. Mm. Uh, and so if you go back and listen, I think it was undone. But you'll hear a little bit of a, you know. Yeah, but, that's... but you'd have to you'd have to listen for that because the flow and the vibe, yeah, it doesn't stick out. The flow and the vibe is proper, so it doesn't stick out. I mean, you could have easily went into the grid and, you know, like spliced it and, you know, but yeah, why? Yeah. Listen, Alan Niven, who, who, who's a friend of mine who managed guns were always said there is a perfection in the imperfection and it's true. And that's why Guns N' Roses first album has that energy and has that vibe. That's why Great White, another band he managed, they have that. And, and Van Halen and all those bands, I mean, David Lee Roth wasn't pitch perfect and the, no. It, yeah. And and that's why we love it. It, 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 it. Listen to any Black Sabbath album. There's there's mistakes everywhere, but you wouldn't change them because. But you know, that's Black gotta Sabbath. tell you, Mitch, Mutt Lang was always in tune singing those Def Leppard backing vocals. <laughs> oh, Mutt Lang, man, Mutt Lang was notorious. We got a few friends that have worked with him. Joe Elliott's got some good stories. Yeah, uh, about working with Mutt Lang, but Mutt Mutt was notorious for making you do it over and over and over and over. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've Joe, had Phil Joe's and Joe really funny stories. He's like, I don't know how many different ways I can scream this, and he, but you know, he stuck in there with Mutt, and of course, some of the best records of all time have been produced by Mutt Lang, of course. Lang. So, so what do collected. you look for in a producer? I mean, we we produce ourselves. We like to go to a, a somebody to maybe maybe somebody to mix. Like in the day, Tom Lord Algie did a lot of our mixes, yeah. and he would he would he would. He would bend some of the songs a little bit. I remember he he did a little bit of arranging on uh, on heavy. So we like to give it to somebody else. But man, we we grew up in the studio and we bounce ideas off each other. And um, we've always done it that way, man. We we don't. Yeah. I I would like to work with a producer. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, Atlanta. We, Brendan O'Brien would be one of those. Uh, Bob Rock. We'd love to work with Bob Rock. Um, oh, wow. Nick. Uh, every time we talk about working that guy's with name? Producer, Nick Razaluzenik or whatever. Nick <laughs> does those, or something. <laughs> yeah. I can never say his name, but he does the Rush stuff and Black Star Riders. He's great. He's great. Yeah. Yeah. And every time we talk about it, we end up doing it ourselves. So, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you see, here's what I say. Hire me and Jeremy and we'll just go, yeah, or... <laughs> That, well, hey, that'll be our day, producing. It's it's the fans that'll speak at the end of the day, right? They'll either love it or they'll hate it. So, yeah, yeah. I, we'll I, be I think like the, fans the uh, are... pizza parlor parfait or whatever that Bon Jovi used to use. Yes, yeah. jeez. <laughs> so, I mean, you're on the road right now, a bunch of different tour dates across the U.S. We need to get you back up here in Canada at some point. Um, I mean, the record is number 22 on the Canadian album sales chart, which is like pure sales, like people buying the record, which is pretty amazing. 
Um, when it comes to the live show, obviously we talked about the set list and stuff, but it's like you're not bringing out the pyro and the confetti. It's a straightforward rock and roll show. Yeah, yeah, man. And again, it's got it's got to boil down. It, it all music when it's boiled down, it's not um, it's not a key signature and a rhythm. It's it it boils down to emotion and somehow. Uh, it's hard to, you know, if I could write a book about it, I would, but somehow you got to find a way to have that emotion in the music and, and you got to find a way to have it uh, transpire to the audience and to the, and to the listener. Um, and, you know, somehow we figure out a way to do it and it's magical when it's right. It, it can heal you. It can, it can, it, it can take you to a different moment. It can make you remember something. It can, it can bring you right back to a moment in time sometimes, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, man. We just you just have to dial that in. And it, it, it is emotion in the end of the day. I don't know how we get there, but we try. How does Collective Soul use social media today? Or do you guys get pressure to be on TikTok and stuff or not well? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not no well. We, we, I, I live in the moment too much to I, I start taking time to mess with these little apps and things and yeah. And I'm like, what am I doing? Uh we should we should probably get into it more, but you know, we just I threw something up the other day. We like to, we like to talk a little bit, try to give people a little bit of insight into what we're going through day to day. That's about the best we can do. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that we should probably focus on a little more, but Hey, yeah, it is what it is. Hey, when you tour with Van Halen, did you get to play through Mikey's like bass rig at all? No, but he's definitely, he used to in 95 uh, and I never would do it. He used to want me to, uh, I think it was after Eddie's guitar solo, we'd always be in Michael's tent, which was called Mad Anthony's Cafe. Right, right, yeah. Um, And we'd be over there, all his breaks, we'd always be hanging out with Michael. Uh, There'd always be some Jack Daniels going around. Um, And Michael used to always want want to put a bass on me and send me out there for – the Sammy Hagar tune uh, when Eagles fly and I would never do it. Cause I'm like, no, I am not stepping on that stage and have Eddie Van Halen and Sammy look at me like, what the heck are you doing? Uh, <laughs> that would have been a good, but, like practical joke though. Come on. I guess it would have been pretty funny to Michael, but me, I would have been like shaking in my boots, man. No. <laughs> it would have been like, Hey man, like what the fuck? Why, why, why exactly. are you out here? <laughs> and I, unless I I'm mistaken. Tells you, you don't get on my stage. <laughs> Eddie played those parts on on the on the Sammy solo record, so you would have been on stage with Eddie playing his parts. Yeah, that would have been fun. Yeah, <laughs> didn't happen. <laughs> um, let me ask you this: in the context of the new Netflix uh, documentary, we, we talk about Woodstock '99 a gazillion times, and I'm sure you're tired of it. But in the new context, with the with the Netflix special out, and everybody, it's sort of in the news again. Does that does that does the documentary reflect what happened properly? I mean, was it was it really a clusterfuck as as they're as they're portraying it, or was your experience a little bit more better? Yeah, well, no, the the vibe was tangible, and we played on Friday. It, it hadn't even, you know, popped yet. It hadn't before hit before the, the fan. shit blew up yeah. in the porta potties. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it was tangible, especially because we played '94 as well. So 1994 Woodstock was, I mean, it was glorious. Uh, um, Aerosmith on was on there. Metallica, I believe. In beautiful venue, Rolling Hills. The artist compound couldn't have been any cooler. Um, we played on that Friday night with a bunch of peers that ended up having long careers. That were all brand new. It was us, Blues Traveler, Cheryl Crow, Live, wow. Candlebox. Wow. And King's X, which was a big deal, real big deal to me. Well, we just uh, interviewed King's X like two days ago. We just oh interviewed. Oh my God. gosh, that was yeah. that was, and they've got a new record out. I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, um, yeah. But that was definitely one of the biggest influences at that time on on all of us, and they were on Atlantic Records. So I got to meet them that day. Um, I, I remember watching King's X side stage, and we were probably two or three bands after them. And I looked out and I saw the 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 ocean of humanity. And I was like, whoa, okay, first off, King's X is one of the best live bands ever. Right. And then I see that that ocean of humanity where I'm about to play in front of. I was I was a little little taken back at that moment. But um 94 was amazing. Uh, and it had the right vibe. 99, man, the moment we pulled up, it, 
it's just like they described it. It was a cement tarmac. It was hot. It felt <laughs> stale. It didn't, it just didn't have anything near the vibe that it did before. Um, and I have seen the documentary. I, I, I chomped right through that thing because I was interested in it. Um, yeah. Four or five episodes. I had it done in one night. Yeah. I would say they portrayed it pretty well. And, and we knew it. We knew it even Friday. We're like, man, we, we, you, you heard the rumblings Friday. They're charging us $4 for water. You, you heard the rumblings on Friday. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and on top of that, like, 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 you know, they, they were on top of a cement tarmac without, there wasn't enough supplies. The infrastructure was not there. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's they, crazy. they were nickel and diming everybody, and they were. It was about making profit. Ninety four was not about making profit, even though they did. It was still about celebrating whatever the twenty fifth anniversary or whatever. It was twenty five. Sort of but but ninety nine, it was just like you know what? They're gonna we're gonna print money. Let's go. Yeah, and let's let's do it again and make a bunch of money this time. You know, um, yeah. and you can't fault somebody for wanting to be profitable, but Lord. <laughs> Boy, they they made some bad decisions, and it, it was tangible even on Friday of of ninety nine. Wow, that's crazy, man! I remember I was watching that doc, and I was just like completely blown away because I was like, "You wouldn't get away with this today." And then again, the fire festival people kind of did. <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, do you prefer doing your own shows, or you prefer festival shows? Because there, there's a there's a different vibe in both. Yeah, I like them both. I love the festivals. We get to see uh, we get to see some friends that we. You know, have you know, get to catch up with some people. Um, so I love it. And, and Collective Soul, we get, we get the, uh, we get the, the benefit of being able to play some hard rock festivals, and and pop festivals. So we we can kind of go either way. So um, yeah, uh, yeah. If, if we're on like a harder rock festival and it's a sixty minute set, we can we can play the heavier bangers. Uh, we still throw like a world I know in, and and we notice. I, I like telling people this. We notice that after getting beat up by, by some of the other hard rock metal, more metal bands, uh, even, even your, even your staunchest rocker is ready for a little break for a world. I know. So, um, yeah, we, we, we can, we can do either one. So yeah, we enjoy the festivals. Uh, well, look, a bunch of different tour dates coming up. Collective Soul and Switchfoot. Check them out. Uh, collectivesoul.com latest record vibrating available now, wherever you get your music too uh will it's always great to chat with you you're welcome back to the show anytime thanks a lot for taking some time to chat today cheers man i appreciate you guys too man hit me up man whenever y'all uh, got something you want to talk about Absolutely. yeah we, we gotta come back we gotta come out to a show mitch we do we do and uh, you gotta follow will on uh, on twitter he's uh, he's a fun follow yep there you go. i do some pretty good stuff on insta gotta, gotta love the here. insta do it for the gram <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll see you later. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank y'all. Merci right. bien. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. Available wherever you stream. Catch up on past interviews and episodes on demand now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of it.